My haunted house. I'm a single guy who had always lived the apartment life, but I was tired of paying rent year after year with nothing to show for it, so I decided to buy a house. I was looking for something small and simple, but when I had the opportunity to buy a big, old, and quite frankly creepy house, I couldn't pass it up. It was a massive two-story Victorian that had a couple things going against it. First, it was a little run down and needed some work. I'm a carpenter by trade, so that was no problem. The thought of fixing up my own home was appealing to me. And it was in a nice area, so after all my home improvements, whenever I decided to sell it, I'd likely make a hefty profit. The other thing going against the house was its history. Back in the 1970s, a man shot his twin sons to death in one of the upstairs bedrooms. The following few owners all reported hearing a lot of strange sounds like footsteps coming from upstairs, doors shutting on their own, and occasional disembodied voices. The last owners of the house had a young daughter who had a heart ailment. She died in the upstairs playroom while rocking in her rocking chair. The creepiest thing about that was that they left that very rocking chair in the playroom. The amount of work that needed to be done, combined with the dark history of the house, allowed for me to get it for a steal of a deal. I had been living in the house for over a month with no paranormal incidents until last night. Last night was Tuesday night. I always go bowling on Tuesday nights. However, earlier in the day, I sprained my thumb pretty good when I hit it with a hammer, so I wasn't going to be able to grip the bowling ball well. Besides, between my job and fixing up the house, I had been working my ass off the past month and I felt like I deserved a night off, so I decided to stay in and vegetate to the boob tube. I had been watching TV for about half an hour or so when I heard the distinct sound of footsteps coming from the floor above me, followed by the floor creaking as if someone had put weight on a weak spot. I cautiously made my way up the winding staircase and was met by a cool draft coming from my bedroom. I stepped into the room and noticed my curtains flowing in the breeze, but I had not left my window open. When I stepped forward and closed the window, I heard a door shut from down the hallway. I quickly stepped into the hall, stopped, and listened. I didn't hear anything, so I called out. Hello? There was no response, so I slowly made my way down the gloomy hallway. I stepped into the first room to my right and looked around. As I opened the closet door to peer inside, I heard another loud creak coming from the hallway. I hurried into the hall, and that's when I noticed the last room on the left. I always kept the doors upstairs open, but the door to this room was closed. And by the way, this was the room where the man killed his sons back in the 1970s. This room was interesting. It was a gigantic bedroom with cathedral ceilings and had an ornate crystal chandelier hanging in the center of it. I was actually planning on taking the chandelier down and selling it because I thought it was worth something and it looked odd in that room. When I stepped into that last room on the left, it was that very chandelier that caught my eye. It was swaying back and forth. What I heard next made my blood chill. It was the subtle giggle of a little girl. <laughs> it was coming from the other end of the hall. After hearing the giggle, I heard loud footsteps stomping down the stairs and heard the echoing squeak of a door opening downstairs. 
I hurried down the hall, raced down the stairs, and found my front door wide open. After that, I did an extremely thorough inspection of the entire house. I didn't find anything unusual until I went back upstairs and entered the playroom. The empty child's rocking chair was in the corner of the room, rocking back and forth. My Haunted House, The Burglar I'm a burglar and was hired by a client to steal a rare crystal chandelier that resides in a spooky old house. Had they contacted me a month earlier, this would have been easy pickings as the house was sitting empty. Unfortunately for me, a man has since moved into the house. I've been watching him from a distance to pick up on his schedule. From what I've been able to determine, this guy goes bowling every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock and is never back any earlier than 9 o'clock. Being that it shouldn't take me more than half an hour to obtain the chandelier, I arrived at the house at 7.30. There's a thick tree that has grown close to the house and extends all the way up to the roof. Lucky for me, it's close to one of the second story windows. As an experienced burglar, I know that it's not uncommon for people to leave their upstairs windows unlocked. I climbed the tree and was easily able to reach the window. Sure enough, it was unlocked. Now I just had to get that chandelier down and then I could mosey right out the back door. This should be a cakewalk. Once I climbed through the window, I casually strolled into the hallway. As I walked down the hallway, I stepped onto a weak spot on the floor and it made an extremely loud creak. Fortunately for me, nobody was home or they would have heard that easily. I shined my flashlight into each room I passed as I walked down the long, dark hall. Finally, I reached the last door on the left and spotted it. The bedroom had cathedral ceilings, but the chandelier was low enough where I thought I could reach it just by standing on a chair. I slid a chair under the chandelier and started working on getting it down. That's when I heard the sound of someone coming up the stairs. I silently got off the chair and eased my way to the door and peeked down the hall. I saw the owner of the house stepping into the bedroom I came in through. This was my own damn fault. Rather than just assuming the man wasn't home, I should have made sure he wasn't home before I entered. I was overconfident and got careless. I stepped back into the room and put the chair back where it was. I was hoping the man would just go back downstairs, then I could climb back out the window, down the tree, and he'd never know I was there. But I must have accidentally bumped the door when he stepped deeper into the room because the door shut, rather loudly. Then I heard the man call out, Hello? I knew this guy was going to check every room. I had to find a way to get out of there. The window in the chandelier room was not near any trees. It was positioned in a way where I couldn't even climb out onto the roof, so that wasn't an option. I snuck back to the door and peeked back out into the hallway. As I did, I noticed the owner step into another room. This was my chance. I opened the door and ever so quietly made my way down the hall. If he wasn't looking as I passed the room, I could sneak right down the stairs and out the front door. And if he did spot me, well, hopefully I could outrun him. As I passed by the room he was in, I gazed in and saw that he was looking in the closet, and the closet door was obstructing his view of me. I was home free. At least I thought I was, until I stepped on that same damn weak spot in the hallway again. I could hear the man running toward the hallway. I would never make it to the stairway without him seeing me, so I ducked into the nearest room. I stepped into the room and gently closed the door behind me. I could hear his footsteps moving down the hall and they were beginning to sound distant. He was likely heading toward the chandelier room, which was perfect. 
My plan was to open the door a bit and spy on him. The moment he stepped into the chandelier room, I'd slink down the stairs and get out of the house without him ever knowing. That's when I heard something behind me. It was the gentle squeak of something rocking back and forth. I slowly turned my head and saw a petite little girl rocking in a child-size rocking chair. She was in a yellow nightgown and her blonde hair was tied in pigtails. She was staring at me and smiling. The little girl let out a loud giggle, and it was then that I realized I could see the back of the rocking chair through her, as if she were transparent. This was a ghost. I swear I could feel my hair standing on end. I no longer cared if the man saw me or not, I just wanted to get out of that house. I flung the door open, rushed down the stairs, threw open the front door, and ran. I jumped in my car and drove away, refusing to look back. I now have a new rule. I no longer rob spooky old houses. The Fisherman I was on my way home after an extremely unsuccessful day of fly fishing. The fish just hadn't been biting and I was feeling a little down because I had my heart set on a fish fry for dinner. As I winded my way down the quiet two-lane road located in an extremely rural mountainous area, I noticed a hitchhiker up ahead. He was of average build, he was wearing ripped blue jeans, a tattered straw hat, and a leather vest with no shirt. He was holding a styrofoam cooler and an incredibly attractive Orvis Helios fly rod. I thought it would be nice to chat with a fellow fisherman, so I pulled over. He was very grateful for the ride. Uh, thanks for stopping. I was afraid I was going to have to walk all the way home. I asked him where he wanted me to take him. Up the road about ten miles, there's a dirt road. Just drop me there and I'll walk it the rest of the way. Fair enough, I said and started driving. As I drove, my eyes kept darting over to that beautiful rod and reel. It sparkled as the sun hit it. I had always wanted one just like that but could never afford it. As we drove along, I tried to start a conversation. How'd you do today? I did quite well. Oh yeah? The fish were biting? The hitchhiker shrugged. I wouldn't know. That statement didn't really make sense, but I was more interested in inquiring about the fly rod. That's one hell of a rod you have there. He eyed the fly rod for a moment. Oh, yeah. You like it? I nodded vigorously. Hell yes! I've always wanted one. My statement seemed to spark the hitchhiker's interest. Oh, uh, would you be interested in buying it? The answer to his question was, damn right I would, but I didn't want to make it obvious to him how badly I wanted it, so I tried to play it cool. Oh, I don't know, I might be. The hitchhiker opened the door to the negotiation. How much would you be uh, willing to give me for it? Now, I knew for a fact that this particular fly rod was worth well over 2,000 bucks. And it looked to be in great shape. If he told me it had never been used, I would have believed him. It looked that good. Since he wanted me to throw out the first number, I decided to lowball him just to see if he'd entertain a low price. How about 500? The hitchhiker's eyes widened. He looked surprised at my offer and spoke quickly. Dollars? Uh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, y you got a deal. I sat there in shock for several seconds. 
I assumed he would counter with something closer to the retail price. I sure didn't expect him to accept my low-ball offer. Clearly, this guy had no idea what he was holding, which begged the question, why did he have such a nice, expensive rod if he was ignorant of its value? Honestly, I didn't care. I just wanted that rod. I tried my best to contain my excitement. I took my time, inhaled deeply multiple times, and nodded casually. Okay. On the outside, I appeared cool, calm, and relaxed. But on the inside, there was a festival going on. I couldn't believe I was going to own this magnificent piece of equipment. My head was in the cloud so much that I didn't even notice the pothole ahead and hit it fully. My entire truck shook like a hula dancer and the hitchhiker had to act fast to keep his cooler from toppling over and spilling out on the inside of my truck. He managed to keep the cooler from tipping over, but in the process knocked the top off of it and I saw exactly what he had inside. Three full-bodied largemouth bass. They were real beauties. There was also a severed human head. He fumbled around with the lid and covered it back up, but he knew it was too late and that I'd seen everything. I quickly pulled over to the side of the road. The hitchhiker and I stared at each other intently as we both contemplated our next moves. I didn't notice that he had a knife on him, but he must have because the severed head and the cooler had been sliced clean. Before he could get any bright ideas, I pulled open my fishing vest, revealing the shoulder holster and my 32 revolver. Upon viewing my gun, he let out a defeated breath and slumped back into the seat. Whose head is that? The fisherman I killed. I wasn't sure how to respond. I sat there staring at the hitchhiker until he spoke again. I guess you're gonna turn me in. I thought for a moment and gave him an alternative. I could do that. Or... I paused just long enough to build up his hopefulness and then continued. You can give me that Orvis Helios rod and those three fantastic largemouth bass for 400 bucks, and I'll forget I ever saw you. We shook on it. I drove him to the dirt road. He thanked me, took his severed head, and went on his way, while I headed home for a fish fry with the best fishing rod I ever owned. Shingles. I'm a 51 year old man and I have shingles. It sucks. In case you didn't know, the chickenpox virus and shingles virus come from the varicella zoster virus. Basically, after someone recovers from the chickenpox virus, the virus goes dormant within the body. Years later, the virus may wake up and decide to say hello. If it does that, you get shingles. So if you've had the chickenpox virus, you have shingles. It's just lying dormant in your body, waiting. Shingles is accompanied by a painful rash and sores that usually take place on only one side of the body or face. The pain varies from shooting pains, burning, and what feels like electrical shocks. The rash and sores turn into blisters that eventually burst open and the fluid leaks out. The fluid is contagious and can possibly spread shingles to another person, but more likely will spread chicken pox to anyone who has yet to have it. Usually after five to seven days, the sores will scab over and begin the healing process, although the pain involved can persist from time to time, even after the rash is completely gone. I got shingles on the right side of my face. 
My forehead and area around my eye had felt tender for a couple of days. Then I noticed a couple of blemishes appear. I figured I just had a couple of pimples and didn't think much else about it, until I noticed that the pimples were burning. That was unusual, and the following day I noticed that the rash had spread. I did a little online research and it sure sounded like I had shingles, and the rash was growing around my outer eye. I decided to go into the local walk-in clinic to verify if my assumption was correct. And it was. I officially had shingles. The doctor prescribed me an antiviral medication, but informed me that if shingles got into my eye, it could cause permanent damage, even blindness. He did a quick exam in his office and looked into my eye. He said it looked fine, but recommended that I see an ophthalmologist to check it out closer. I found one that would take a look at me that day and he confirmed that my eyes were fine and showed no signs of shingles, which was a relief. Within a few days, the sores started scabbing over and it appeared that I was well on my way to healing up when I noticed that I had significant swelling under my right eye. By the next morning, the entire right side of my face was swollen up like a balloon. I went to the doctor again and learned that swelling like this could also occur with shingles and if I just kept taking the medicine, it would go down pretty soon. But it didn't. The next day my entire face was swollen up and I had a new outbreak of sores on the left side of my face. I was going to go back to the clinic to see what they thought of that but wanted to take a shower first. When I disrobed, I noticed that I now had a rash on my body, both sides of my ribcage, and also on both of my forearms and both of my thighs. This was alarming, especially since they said that shingles always attacks just one side of the body. I went to the hospital and the doctor I saw was dumbfounded. He had never seen anyone with shingles on both sides of their body to this extent before. I felt like some kind of lab rat for the next four hours as doctors after doctors came in and examined me. And the shingles was continuing to spread at a rapid pace. The rash on my rib cage had now completely wrapped around my entire torso. All areas of my legs and arms were covered. My face was also entirely covered and it had spread down to my neck. The pain was unbearable. It came in waves every few seconds. It felt like someone was flipping the switch on an electric chair and then shutting it off. None of the pain medicine they induced helped in the slightest. The medical people had never seen anything like this. Dozens of doctors flew in to get a look, some even from other countries. None of them had any explanation as to why this was happening or how to stop it, and they were all visibly concerned. For a long while, I was panicked and fearing for my life. I welcomed the array of doctors, hoping that maybe one of them would find the answer to my condition. Then something started to change with my mentality. My fear was disappearing and was being replaced by aggravation. I was aggravated with the doctors. They weren't capable of helping me. They knew nothing. They were all insignificant, ignorant peons. When I had the room to myself for a few moments, I got out of my hospital bed, went into the bathroom and looked into the mirror. I was now completely enveloped by the disease. The rash had become thick and scaly. It covered my entire body now. My previous flesh had been entirely replaced with this hard, crusty rash. Even my hair was no longer visible through the scabby skin. I was beautiful. That's when it dawned on me. I wasn't getting worse. I was getting better. The shingles virus had opened doors in my mind that I didn't realize I had, and it finally all made sense. The virus wasn't a sickness. It was salvation. 
This virus had been alive for centuries, as it spread from host to host for tens of thousands of years. It was learning, growing, evolving. And now it reached its pinnacle. I am the first of my kind. A new breed of varicella zoster virus and human hybrid. I heard the door to my room open and listened to the footsteps of somebody entering. This was an opportunity. I stepped out of the bathroom and saw a nurse standing near my bed. She couldn't conceal her horrified expression. Fool, she doesn't know what beauty is, but she will. I rushed her, shoved her to the bed and pinned her down. She screamed, but I didn't care. Her screaming would stop soon enough. I drove my forearm down on her throat to hold her in place while I moved my face close to hers. She tried to squirm, but couldn't. I was far too powerful for her now. With my free hand, I drove my fingers into my crusted forehead, ripping my flesh away and allowing the infected fluid to flow from my face. As she screamed, my viral pus oozed into her mouth and ran down her throat. It was then that two security guards entered the room and physically pulled me from her, which was perfect. When they grabbed my arms, my skin peeled away into their grasp, coating them with my fluid. I was so strong now that I could have tossed those goons aside like infants but I wanted to give the ploy that they needed more assistance so that I could spread my infection further. And it worked. As more people entered the room to help, my fluid spewed onto their soft flesh. Within a span of 90 seconds, I was able to infect four security guards, three nurses, and two doctors. Now that the virus has reached full maturity, it took hold immediately. They wouldn't have to wait as long as I did. They were transformed into their new state within mere minutes. I watched on proudly as those who I infected changed and awakened. They too immediately knew that they must spread the virus to as many as they could. Ten minutes later, the entire hospital was infected. By nightfall, the entire state. We have a world to wake up. By this time next week, you'll be one of us. <laughs>